Welcome to Big Blend Radio with your hosts, Lisa and Nancy, editors of BigBlendMagazine.com. Welcome to Big Blend Radio's first Friday toast to the Arts and Parks show with Nancy Reed and Lisa Smith, where the crazy mother-daughter travel team and publishers of Big Blend Radio and TV Magazine, as well as Parks and Travel Magazine. Both of them are digital publications, and you can check them out. Just go to BigBlendMagazine.com. And, you know, over the past few years, the National Parks Arts Foundation has partnered with Dry Tortugas National Park, west of Key West in southern Florida, and they work together to create a really unique once-in-a-lifetime artisan residence opportunity. It's in a pristine isolation, like you are on your own island. Like, I seriously, this it. is amazing. Loggerhead Key. Um, you know, we do our first Friday shows with the National Parks Arts Foundation every month and uh, for the last few years now, and we chat with the artists that have, they're e while they're either there or um, when they return, and uh, when it's up, out in the Dry Tortugas on Loggerhead Key, we can't really talk to them because they really are in pristine isolation. Mm -hmm. uh, so today's show, we're chatting with the fourth and most recent artist in residence, the couple, Vanessa Chan and uh, Gavin Mulvey, and uh, we also have park ranger Curtis Hall on the show. So I want to make sure you go to the website to check out the National Parks Arts Foundation. You go to nationalparksartsfoundation.org. Um, Artists, musicians, writers, photographers, filmmakers, poets, dancers, uh, painters. The program is open to all art mediums. They even have a program just for military veterans. Um, the best thing to do is to sign up for their newsletter when you go there so you can get alerted of these amazing opportunities. Uh, they come in and then they go. And you want to be there. You want to submit your proposal and get accepted. So at National Parks Arts Foundation and check out Dry Tortugas National Park. Go to nps.gov forward slash DRTO. And uh, that's how it always works mm -hmm. with the National Park Service. And then DennisAchanPhotography.com is the website to go to. So I want to bring Park Ranger Curtis Hall on the show first uh, because we want to hear a little bit about Dry Tortugas. Uh, welcome to the show, Curtis. How are you? I'm wonderful. Thank you for having me. Hey, this is exciting. Uh, Dry Tortugas, it just seems like, you know, like Hawaii Volcanoes National Park that you're like really off the grid, <laughs> literally, and I think you are, right? Loggerhead Key is off the grid, and you seem so far away, and uh, one of the most unique national parks that we have in the in, in NPS. It is quite a bit off the grid, uh, and definitely within the contiguous U.S. Uh, it is coined the most remote national park within the contiguous U.S. Of course, um, Hawaii Volcanoes is much further away. We have places such as Guam. We have places like American Samoa, which are in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, Alaska, which would also be more remote. But as far as the continu contiguous U.S., Dry Tortugas is the most remote. So what you would do to get there, um, I generally say you can go get there a few different ways, but you go south past our, our sister park and our parent park, uh, Biscayne and the Everglades, and you continue on down the Florida Keys. And when you, you get to Key West, you, you, you jump on a boat or a seaplane, I suppose if you're a really good swimmer, you could try that as well. Um, but you head out about another 70 miles west, and then you'll get to a, a series of tiny islands, which make up the Dry Tortugas. So about seven tiny islands, and I'm saying about because the geomorphology does change out there with them being sand islands, and um, that's quite oh, a bit wow. different than volcanic atolls that, that we have in the Pacific. So these are sand islands. So the 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 shape and the structure is constantly changing, especially when we have hurricanes such as Irma last year. Um, and then, you know, like we, we've had recently passed by as well, that can actually change the shape where sand either accretes or erodes. Um, but about 70 miles out, then we've got Garden Key, and the very last would be Loggerhead Key, which uh, Danessa and Gavin lived on for over a month so the the true key west in my standpoint would be loggerhead key because that is technically the very last key in the florida keys reef track wow wow, wow. and so this is what's so amazing about this cool. artisan residence program is and you have to have two people together because you are really out on your own and it you know when you think about the importance of 
their work now broadcasting to the world, like showcasing Dry Tortugas, um, because not everyone's always going to be able to get out to Dry Tortugas. So do you find that as being this part of that positive part of sharing the park with audiences worldwide, uh, Curtis, with this kind of program? Absolutely. It is. It is a hurdle and that. That's a, a beautiful blessing and a, a great collaboration with some of the work that they did is is not everyone is going to be able to get out there. I mean, from mm -hmm. being realistic, school groups, Title I schools in, in, in Iowa are not going to be able to, to get all the way down the Keys, not all of them, and then stay in Key West, get on a boat. The sea state is not always going to cooperate with you. There are multiple different natural elements involved, not only to, to mention some of the financial commitments as well. So the fact that that these two are able to capture these amazing natural and cultural resources that mm -hmm. then we can share with the public, <laughs> that I can go put in school rooms. That's part of my job is education and uh -huh. outreach, working with local school groups up and down Monroe County. So the fact that, that they were able to capture these things where unless you're staying overnight for multiple days and seeing these storms run through and, and some of these turtle releases and hatchings, you're it would be a very, very rare select few of timing to get those opportunities. So being able to share those nationwide or even outside our borders is pretty amazing. I'm, I'm really excited about it. And the work is absolutely amazing, oh, um, everyone. Uh, again, the website, Dennis, uh, Chan Photography com. That's D-E-N-E-S-A. And I wanted to pronounce that in so many different ways because we speak different languages here. <laughs> so if I got it wrong in the part way through, I apologize. But I want to bring Dennisa and, and also Gavin on the show. Uh, now, Dennisa is an award-winning filmmaker and nature photographer. And then Gavin is going to save your life if you're stuck on a mountain somewhere or in a ravine. Or so he's going to come and save you. And he's like, like James Bond. Yes, he's won a lot of different uh, <laughs> world records for all kinds of crazy things like that. And Gavin's from New Zealand. So welcome, Dennisa. How are you? Thank you so much. I'm great. How are you? Doing good. Doing good. Excited to have you on the show and just totally blown away by your photography. And it just, oh, Nan amazing. Nancy and I on our oh, Love Your Parks tour, we just, we want to go there. We want to go there so it's bad. Like, take a left turn quick. Yeah. But you also <laughs> oh, have this you. ability of not only giving a sense of space, place and space, but also showcasing the intricacies of nature, how she moves, how she bends, uh, you know, the diff the little pieces that make this beautiful creature or place. Uh, you have a real, like, just this amazing talent for that, to just open our eyes and be more aware to what we're looking at. When you may take a walk somewhere, but not notice any everything. But you have this knack of really showing us things that we don't always get to see. So I appreciate oh, that. Thank you. Thank you. That is that is my goal at through photography. So the fact that you're saying that just means so very much. So thank you so much. Oh, you bet. Mm. And thank you. We're like, yay, we get to show off your photos. They're so amazing. <laughs> They're amazing. And I wanna just I wanna go to Dry Tortugas. Uh, mm. I wanna bring Gavin on. Gavin, welcome. How are you? Oh, thank you. I'm well. And that's good. I heard that you guys live in a yurt. On, on a regular basis, right? And that you built the yurt, is that true? Yes, we do live in a yurt um, off the grid. Um, the yurt, I made the yurt all out of uh, recycled materials. Um, right. Yeah. Wow. Right on. Yeah, it's pretty, right. pretty cozy. Nice. And so when oh, you went to dry oh. tortugas, was it that much of a stretch <laughs> for you guys? Because <laughs> I know you've been all over the world, like, you know, you've been to the Arctic Circle. I mean, you've been all over. Uh, Gavin, was it something that you were, like, overly prepared for? Or just, you know, this is this is another, another you know, mark on, on the, on the uh, scale of experiences? Oh, well, it's a desert island, which is something new for me. Um, oh. I've been to, yeah, I've spent a lot of time in the Gobi Desert, um, but um, being on a, well, a tropical island is, is definitely a, a change of scenery for me. Mm, nice, nice. What would you say people should be, you know, for future artists and residents that they should be prepared for uh, just, you know, to keep themselves safe because you're out on your own? What would you say they need to be prepared for? Oh, it's actually a, a pretty nice spot. There's not too much in the way of bugs or dangerous things there. The climate's pretty nice. Um, yeah, it's a pretty nice place to be for a month. Um, well, pretty well set up. There's a solar system there. There's water making facility. Um, the house is pretty nice. Nice. Um, yeah, not too much to complain just, about, really. 
I think it looks like a little piece of paradise. If you ask me, I could live there. I mean, we haven't been there, but I could live there. Danessa, would you live there? (laughs) Oh, totally. Yeah. I mean, if we, if given the opportunity, I would definitely, because I mean, you'd think over, over 30 days, over a month on an, on, in one place would be plenty, but when it comes down to it, no, the, the, the rhythm of the place, the sights, the sounds of the place, they just permeate inside. And, and so by the time we were leaving, it was really sad to, to leave this, this mm. place that had become really a part of us. Did you start to get to know the different habits? and rituals of the different, you know, wildlife species of birds, you know, I know that you photograph these amazing turtles. And mm. um, I want to talk about that, too, because did you feel like you could just sit back and, and watch and photograph, at, you know, just in a very calm space? It was a very calm space. Yes. I mean, it wasn't, <laughs> there was, a, it's always a mixture for me anyway, when it comes to photography, and especially wildlife, um, and especially anything underwater because there are so many variables and um so it's a mixture of this this taking in this amazing beautiful serenity that just comes through um and also there's a little bit of adrenaline of the th- all the things that I have to do so there's a there's a really peaceful calm in the center kind of of the storm and then there's also this really really technical aspect of it so my brain's firing at a million miles a minute going oh okay I gotta do this and I gotta make sure about that and oh let me check this and <laughs> um mm-hmm. but both yeah <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's beautiful out there. I'm from you know, I was also looking. You've got lighthouse photos too. Was that out at the fort or is that at Loggerhead? There is a, a lighthouse at Loggerhead Key, and that um, is just a, a gorgeous historic structure that was on the island. Um, that it's not currently running, but in the past it had helped to save countless numbers of ships as they made their way along the gulf and curtis i'm sure can talk a lot more about that than me mm, yeah curtis because that's the one thing it did you ever get pirates out there <laughs> pirates. were there rum runners curtis <laughs> well, it, of course i mean the keys is famous for for rum runners and you know the navy yeah. getting established here and when it when it did in the 1800s, you know, to combat things of that nature. But going back even further than that, if if you really think about what happened when you know, Christopher Columbus came over and, and other Spanish explorers, what were they doing? They were trying to to get some of that silver and gold, establish new lands, and and then they would jump on these Gulf Stream currents because that would help take them back over to these European areas much much faster. It's, of course, it's like the the people mover at an airport where we stand on that one and it, it gets us where we're going a lot faster. But they discovered that at that time, you know, during around 1513. And <clears throat> the thing is, were there pirates? More than likely, yes. However, there's not a lot of documentation of pirates settling at the Dry Tortugas. We know that Ponce de Leon was here. We know that they stopped here and that turtles were a main food source. You could get a turtle and one of these large sea turtles that are beautiful and, of course, protected now. Take them down on the lower deck of a ship. If you put them upside down, they can't rewrite themselves, so to speak. But if you dump water on them a couple of times a day, they would stay alive as you transited back across the Atlantic where you were going. So it was a vital food source. And now that they are protected, we've actually seen a number of increases in their hatchlings as well but um pirates i i don't doubt that they were but as far as historical record i don't i don't know uh, i don't i can't really answer that one accurately mm. it's just such a fascinating history the whole state of florida is fascinating we've got the oldest city in the nation with saint augustine you know being up up further north from you but when you think about that and, and ponce de leon coming over and yeah it's just such a rich history. When it comes to the wildlife, I wanted to go back to Danessa about this because when you look at photographing, do you kind of keep your distance from them? Because the, you put there's people who take photos where you can get real close, right? You get those close-ups, and then what I really enjoy about yours is you do both, but you also make you make everyone aware of where you are you know, that you have that sense of place while you're photographing a turtle, you know, you're able to do that. Um, do you kind of keep your distance back? How how do you capture those amazing images? Oh, thank you so much. 
Um, well, I was able to capture them because it was super fortunate that there were um, a couple of um, master's candidates doing some uh, thesis work out there. And so what we did is um, I documented the research that they were doing. Um, and I do need to mention that it was done under triple permit number 187, which means that we were allowed access to document the work that was being done, um, but obviously, of course, to not harass, not manipulate, you know, not touch the animals in any way. So um, when you see these photographs, um, just know that it, it was by special permission, and we really, it's, it's, it's absolutely um, not at all <laughs> allowed to harm or harass any, any animals in the park, but especially endangered ones. Mm. So, um, but to answer your question about the process, um, so the researchers, what they do is they walk around and they um, inventory any turtle nests that were um, laid on the island. So they know um, when, what dates they were laid and they know it takes about 60 days for the eggs to stay in the nest before the hatchlings start to come out. Um, and then when they come out, it's really obvious because there are a lot of little, cute little tiny turtle tracks just emerging from in all different directions. And then they mark the date that a turtle, um, a, a turtle nest has hatched. And then um, about three to 16 days after that, they will dig up the nest to see how many eggs have been hatched, how many eggs were um, um, predated, how many eggs, um, you know, seem to hatch successfully. And, and every once in a while, there will be hatchlings that are still in the nest for whatever reason and um, and then so what they do is they'll just release those turtles um, at a time that's appropriate and naturally the turtles hatch during the nighttime although mm. we were walking around the island and we did see some that came yeah. out um, before sunset or after sunrise so there's a, a little bit of a, of a of a blending of the time so it's a little bit sometimes before sunset and sometimes after sunrise um, mm. So huh. we would go out um, with the the the, um, the researcher, the intern, and we would document the digging process, the inventory process, and then when he was releasing hatchlings, we'd really get the opportunity to follow them as they made their journey from the stand. And he would always, you know, release them right at the nest where they were hatched, so it's as natural as possible. And then because um, sometimes when he, when he was doing his digging, it was usually not during their, their natural hatching time, you know, not, mm. not their natural time. So he'd just take them back there um, within the time frame of their natural hatching and they would um, make their way to the ocean. And these, these, we're talking about hatchlings that are maybe two to three inches long and two different species. Mm. Yeah, so, so tiny. And they're just like the essence of cuteness. <laughs> yeah, no, they're like little lizards. Yeah. Help me. I know. They're like, I want to, I want to get there. I want to get there. It's yeah. so amazing. And, and then you look at the jellyfish, so the jellyfish photo oh, that you have. Amazing. It looks like the jellyfish could swallow the little turtle. It's like, no. Oh, <laughs> <for heart's laughs> <to bother. laughs> oh that's so funny because um, we were working with two different species there the loggerhead turtles, the namesake of that island, and the green turtles as well, and both are considered mm. endangered, and both are protected. Um, but the green turtles, I mean, the loggerhead turtles, um, their, their preferred meal are the moon jellies. So that's actually oh, wow. the other way around. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. Um, that's a, I didn't yeah. know they ate those I, at all. I didn't, I didn't even think about who ate jellyfish for some reason. I just, <laughs> <laughs> they're a trip, man. That's to, to, I think they're just alien. They're neat. They're <laughs> space alien. They're neat. But this is interesting because Gavin, you were you were talking about this being, you know, because they're sand islands, right? They're, but this is like a desert island, and for us, you know, we we live in the desert right now in Tucson, and when you hike and you look at all the plants like ocotillos and saguaro cactus and organ pipe cactus, and you know, you, and just we've got some of the most ancient plants in the world here, the creosotes and when we walk, we always think like we are in the, and you know, we're in, we're in the ocean. And I know we've talked about this all the time on the shows because we feel that way. But when you're looking at your photos, you know, I'm going, oh my gosh, look at the the coral have fingers and they want to say hello to you. <laughs> it's like, I don't know. It's like you can see them stretch out and enjoy the sunshine. So it's, it feels interesting. I mean, Gavin, did you feel like you were in the desert? Even though you're on this tropical island, when you when you talked about going to Gobi Desert, which I've always wanted to go to, did you feel like you're still it's still a desert? 
it's interesting that change. Uh, if you're in the outside in the middle of the day under the sun, it certainly feels like a desert. <laughs> 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 yeah. um, no, I guess um, yeah, there's palm trees and um, yeah, cactus and um, lots of vegetation there. So. Oh, there's um, cactus out there too, huh? Yeah. There's oh, a neat. few cactus there. Yep. That's neat. So the Gobi Desert. Okay, so I want to ask each of you, what got you into the world? I know Gavin, you're from New Zealand. Um, what, where was this thing that said, okay, I'm going to go off and be a survivor specialist and, and, you know, get out there in nature and go to these wild places of the earth. What, when did that start for you? Was that something as a kid that just, you know, kept building up and taking you further afield? Um, well, I, I, um, I guess I had a, um, a background in sort of outdoorsy things all my life. And then, um, I actually started doing that to, um, get some qualifications to help me get a job in Antarctica um, oh, wow. and, then, and then I went and worked down there for a year and then um, just kept doing it really just as a, a volunteer basis it's not it hasn't been a job or anything like that wow just people and I mean to, to learn do you think people I mean what you do as you know being understanding the natural world that way understanding survival do you think people have a fear? Do you think sometimes the, the predicaments they get into is not understanding the natural world and fear as well? Because it oh, does I sound think, scary. So, when you hear sure. survival specialist, you go, uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think people, people do have a fear, and a fear of the unknown. Mm. Um, it's, it's nice to have a, a confidence that you can um, throw yourself into any situation and know you've, you've got, um, got the tools to get yourself back out of it. Mm. Mm. I think that through the arts, this is one of those um, ways of educating and, and removing that fear a little bit. And I think, Danessa, with your work, when I look at it, it just, there's a warmth to it. There, it's more inviting and, and, and it's, you know, like, wow, look at the natural world as we, you know, all get scared about what's going on with climate change when we look at what's happening in the world politically. You know, everybody's like, eh, eh, eh. eh there's this beauty to nature and you're just looking at these images going, okay, you know, we need to protect this. And it's just a very positive, we need that positive stuff right now. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So it, it's, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that's a, a beauty of it. So it helps take that fear away sometimes when, when you look at the beauty that we have out there in the world. Thank you. you know? Yes. And that's a very conscious um, in, intention for me through my work. Um, there are people who are really good at drawing attention to the problems, and we do need to pay attention to those. Um, that's not me. <laughs> um, where my strength lies is drawing attention to the beauty, drawing attention to what we still do have, and drawing attention to the sense of wonderment and connection that we all innately have just as beings of this earth. And so I think it's really easy. Um, like I grew up in gang territory in uh, in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. and in a in a really urban environment, it's really easy to just not even know that there are all these amazing majestic moments happening all over the planet every single day. So um, I guess one of my missions is to open up people's hearts to to know that there's all this beauty around, and it's something that that we just have an innate ability to appreciate as human beings. It's something that connects all of us. Every single living and non-living thing on this planet is intimately connected. And so, um, yeah, I, I see my, my mission, one of my missions is to help people fall in love with nature so that they will take positive action. Um, and even, you know, a lifetime of positive action, ideally, um, even okay. if that action, you know, it doesn't have to look like, um, like typical, like stereotypical action. It could be, you know, my positive action could be making eye contact with someone on the street and just really being present. And I, you know, it could be something that small. It could be something huge. You know, it could be creating a, this whole sustainable, you know, culture. Or it could be anything. But really, I think every every little bit helps to positively impact how we as humans relate to everything around us. Yeah. Mm. I, I agree. I, think I like that a lot. Yeah, it's, <laughs> you know, because you do. We we move around so fast, and there's so much on our plates to handle that we forget what we're doing half the time. You know, and we forget to look at things. 
So, you know, Lisa and I take a walk almost every morning and, and usually exactly the same pathways. And every time you see something different, mm -hmm. you know, so mm, it's, yeah. it's, yeah, you know, so then you start really starting to look not just at the great sunrises or sunsets, but little bugs and different little sure. flowers that you just would walk by and not notice. It's orb, yeah. orb weaving spiders, a weaver, oh, orb that, weaver. That spider is amazing. We, it's, they're out yeah. everywhere. Yeah, it's just, fine back orb weaver, yes. Yeah. yeah. Oh man, they're so cool. They're like- I, I have one in my backyard that's my pet. I feed him mosquitoes, him or her. <laughs> but I feed him <laughs> mosquitoes, but <laughs> yes, people they're think amazing. I'm a little odd. But we, we had a little bit of a disagreement because it kept putting its uh, web directly across where I had my bike stored outside. But finally, yeah. we, came to an agreement and they uh, made their, their web right underneath my spotlight, which was much better. So I throw mosquitoes out there and, you know, <laughs> now, now it's, now it's, it's, mutual, it's, it's a mutual relationship now. And just going back to what you said about those kind of small impacts we have in others' lives, you're, you're absolutely correct. Um, I got a, a letter from a, a young student today, a, a teenager, and it was from a homeschool group that we recently brought out. Um, and I took them on a snorkeling tour out there, and, and of course I did a, a swim test prior, and then I, I mentioned, hey, you know, make sure that you look for some of the smaller things. Here are some of the corals you can encounter. Here are some mm -hmm. of the sea fans. Um, and she was so amazed by Christmas tree worms, mm -hmm. and also by some of the small things wow. that now she, as a 13, 14 year old, is trying to write a book uh, and, and asking me for more information now is the third or fourth email I have. And it's, it all stems wow. from, from just slowing it down a little. And she said, yeah. you know, I, oh, I saw this barracuda. It was sitting there. I'm like, well, did you see inside its mouth how it had the small gobies in there cleaning its teeth, uh, brushing its teeth? She's like, no. I'm like, well, if you look for the smaller things, you won't miss those big mm. things. But if all we do in life is miss for, look for those big things, we'll often overlook those smaller things. So it's exactly like what Danessa just mentioned with, mm -hmm. it can be in a simple gesture, a smile, that these can be engagements mm -hmm. that, that affect people and even change behaviors. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. nice. that, wow. that is so positive, especially for our youth, you know, and I think that's the role the arts play as well as is to, engage the youth it's a and, and we're so visual too photography is such a we're so visual as human beings and mm -hmm. i just anything that we can realize that we're connected in some way you know it's it's to, mm -hmm. to the natural world is, is good it's good to be barefoot did you guys run around barefoot on the on the stand come on you did right yes. <laughs> Are you, i believe yeah. they went ran around more than barefoot that's, that's the, <laughs> <laughs> all right <laughs> they were <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Run free at Loggerhead Key, everybody. <laughs> That's it. But I mean, hey, you got to be free in the wind, you know. That's what it's, it's, you know, as nature, Mother Nature intended. It's a true thing. It's like. That's the thing. We're, that's when we travel. It's like, uh oh, we have to put shoes back on. Why? We don't want to wear shoes. Yeah. Can't we just yeah, be barefoot everywhere? <laughs> totally. You know? It's like. Little kids, when they reach that age where they can finally start walking, um, th like one of the first things they want to do is when you want to put clothes on them, they they wriggle out and then they run outside. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, so I think it's something it's so natural. It's innate. You know? <laughs> That's, I think it's the way it should be. I don't know what it is, but it always goes to you this always, on our shows. You always took your clothes off and she used to run around the garden still do. in her underpants. Me, <laughs> I'm like, put those back on. No. no. <laughs> well, that's how that's how you learn how to to send. When Nancy went to Kenya, she worked with Joy Adamson um, from Born Free, also the Lion, and all that stuff. But she was there to track. Uh, it was a leopard the at leopard, the time, yeah. and she went and and get in the camp with Joy Adamson. And Joy Adamson, the first day, made her go out, and it was like oh. it was closing down towards sunset. And made her sit on a rock, blindfolded, <laughs> naked. naked. <laughs> so that. <laughs> And I know people freak at that, but it was like so that you understand your senses. You learn how to yeah. smell, how to sense, and mm -hmm. use your senses. And coming from L.A. to that mm -hmm. was like a big wake-up call. <laughs> yeah, so, she, really, she said she's, oh, she was so, we know your eyes work. Yeah. But you need to be able to smell 
what's going to come up behind you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, because you're out in the bush and, and there are animals that are, you know, like, hello, what are you doing in my territory? <laughs> so, you know, yeah. some of them are pretty big. So um, it was it was an interesting thing. And it, it really is amazing that when you blindfold yourself, um, mm -hmm. you your sense of smell gets better. Mm -hmm. It's really amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It really yeah. does. So, so even in the military, a little bit of quick background on myself, I was in the military for many years prior to um, becoming a, a Park Service Ranger. And I was in spec ops. And one of the things we used to do is we would close our eyes in different rooms when we needed to utilize our senses and almost find where trip wires were. We would stop and go wow. into a room and absolutely close our eyes because then we could hear more. We would start relying on other senses because our, our vision, you know, mm -hmm. isn't as, as good as, as we may think, but our, our sense of touch and actually hearing it. So we would close our eyes. We would take one sense away to kind of heighten others. And they, wow. they taught that tactic in spec ops in the military. Wow. Did you have That's to take amazing. your clothes off? <laughs> yeah, I know. Really. <laughs> Wait, I, I want to go to Gavin. What do you think? What do you think about mm -hmm. this? Would, do you do that kind of thing too in your training? Uh, yes, yeah, sometimes. Um, I've, uh, me and a friend tried some um, caving without uh, lights at all. Um, and I don't know if you've been in a cave that's extremely dark. Um, and after a, um, a few hours of it, um, yeah, your, your hearing gets um, so in tune that you can you can tell where you are in the space. You can tell how close the wall is to you. Um, you can tell um, if there's a, a small waterfall coming up. You can tell how, how high it is. Um, mm. And your 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 sense of hearing really really exactly. gets tuned up. That's amazing. You know, cool. speaking of darkness, um, the sky, you took these amazing night sky photos with this, you know, mm. just the stars are just like such like this beautiful blanket, you know, and mm -hmm. I think that is something to be truly treasured. And again, one of those important things to showcase, because a lot of times you think of parks in the day, we don't think about parks at night, what's happening at night. I know a lot of parks do night hikes and, you know, that's super cool because you see all these other bugs and snakes and, you know, other cool critters and there's like all the nocturnal things are going on. But the stars is something so important that we get to have this lack of uh, pollution in the skies. And, um, you know, we're all, where we are right now in Tucson, we're very lucky the, the night pollution is pretty uh, low because there's no street lights. I know where we are whenever we go out to go really early, like it's dark, man. Um, so, I mean, was that something really special to, to, for you guys to be out there? And I know that you've been into all these wild places around the world, but it's something to me that I think is really important that doesn't get as much attention about the importance of night skies and the importance of uh, really going and exploring a park at night. Yes, I love, I love night. That's one of my favorite. Oh, no, everything's my favorite, but <laughs> that's one of my favorite. <laughs> uh, one of my favorite aspects. Yes, absolutely. It's so important. It's like, it's what, it's what we looked up at, you know, we, uh, humans from long ago, from maybe tens of thousands of early humans from long ago, looking up at the night sky, asking those big questions, wondering how we're connected or if we're connected. And those, those are such important foundational aspects of humanity that we lose a sense of when we're in a city and we can't see stars and it does feel like we're in a bubble you know and so yeah the night sky is super important to me and it's one of the one of the the, the ways I give back through my work is I donate about 50 percent of my profits to tangible meaningful projects that help that particular species or ecosystem or aspect of nature mm -hmm one that's in the photo, photograph itself. So um, Dark Sky International, if people are interested in preserving dark, you know, natural night skies, they're a really good organization. And the park, National Park Service itself has a night sky division mm -hmm. too. And they're doing yeah. a lot of really good programs. So look them up. They're, they're great too. But yeah, it's, it's so important. And not, not just the, the stars, as if the stars weren't enough, which they absolutely are. <laughs> um, but yeah, like you were saying, there's species that come out only at night. Um, mm -hmm. There's there's different activities. Of, almost it's like the rhythm of the place changes. It has mm -hmm. a different flavor to it. Yeah, and we miss that mm -hmm. when we don't mm -hmm. when we're not connecting at those hours. 
I want to go to and, Curtis on this. If you could give well, us some could, ideas of what happens at night. Do you have night programs for visitors? So we, we have limited programs just because of our amount of staffing and being so remote, but we do have some night programs. So we've done a couple of uh, photo night workshops. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes we'll have bioluminescence and a moat. We'll do a, 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 a photo shop there um, or we'll just do a, a small kind of informal type program we do evening fishing programs but as far as hiking we have a lot of safety concerns uh, inside the fort outside the fort with areas that are not lighted so therefore we don't want to be bringing people on the top chair plane where it could yeah. pose a significant safety hazard but I did want to go back to something that hmm. uh, Danessa mentioned so one the international dark skies and, and national parks that is a certification which we're also seeking so to become a, a international certified dark sky park. And then she also mentioned that she loves exploring at night. I can definitely validate that because these two, <laughs> after a morning where I said, okay, we're doing dive ops and we're starting around eight. So you could join us, but I'd have to get over here and pick you up over at Loggerhead before she's like, okay, we'll be on the dock at 7.15. <laughs> like, okay. And then in the evening, we have a potluck every Wednesday. It also happened to be um, someone's baby shower. So we do that. We have a little bit of normalcy, even though that we're a very remote island. They join us for a potluck. It's 8.30, 9 o'clock, going into 10 o'clock, and I see the two of them walking out with mask, bin, and snorkel. And I'm asking, so where are you going? We're going to go explore. We're going to go get in the water and swim around the moat. And like, okay. So <laughs> they do that above and, below the, <laughs> above and below the water line. It doesn't matter if it's submerged or not. These two definitely explore at night and, and uh, utilize all the park's resources. That's so cool, though. There's <laughs> How much some, fun is that? There is, you know, that's wow. the thing. I, don't you sometimes just wish we didn't have to sleep? Because then you can see everything all the time. Like you would be able to. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I know. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's, it's annoying it's that we have to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. And it's funny because people think, oh, it's like a month on an on an island all to yourself. It must be so relaxing. And, and while, yes, it is relaxing just to be in nature, but also, mm -hmm. you know, I have this sense, like both of us, all of, I think all, probably everybody on this listening and you know, all of you guys have the sense of just, oh, there's so much to see. So it's constantly yeah. like this, this tug of war with myself going, okay, I need to take care of myself and I will take care and, and I will do that and I will give myself some sleep. But also, oh, I just want to be awake and <laughs> just yeah. to see everything and soak it in. Yeah, it, it, does, it seems like sleeping seems like a big waste of time. I know, but your body <laughs> needs it. We need it apparently. It does. Um, yeah, it's, you get cranky. But, it's important. but and, all and I, I can I, say I, is, I thank God for coffee. <laughs> That's funny. Well, Gav and I are not coffee people, so yeah. Oh, but wow. yeah. <laughs> Let's do some tea. I hope you do tea. Do you do tea? No, no. we love tea. We love it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I just had my my nice you know positive energy yogi tea. <laughs> just, <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> I love tea. Tea is good. Tea is like mm. I love coffee and tea, but I can't drink a lot of coffee. But uh, and nobody needs to see me on too much coffee. <laughs> you know, just, <laughs> I, the radio shows be like, oh. <laughs> yeah. That, um, that one affects I, us all. What What about some other food? There was one thing that you had mentioned, Vanessa, about kind of maybe some recommendations for other artists and residents. And yeah, food-wise, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so um, life lesson. I've run this experiment, so you all don't have to. <laughs> um, do not. <laughs> do, I do not recommend freezing yogurt because what what you end up with. So it's one of the challenges was packing food for thirty days, and then right. you know. Um, we did have access to a refrigerator with a freezer in it. So you run out of fresh food and I'm thinking, well, I want my food to last and not spoil. So I'll put some of it in the freezer. Um, so when you do that with the yogurt, what you end up it, with is gritty. Basically, it, it's like sand, but it's you have like grit and then wa water like substance. So you have Ew. milk flavored sand. Ew. So I was living <laughs> off of for the past, like the last two weeks there. <laughs> not recommended. Oh, wow. Okay. So, but yeah, because you do take things that are like dehydrated and, and things like that, you know, food wise that you can just heat up with water and, you know, reconstitute it. That's the well, word. Reconstitution. Some, yeah, that's a, it's pretty popular with a lot of um, hikers and backpackers. But for us, you know, we just really like real food. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> we, we piled up uh, a shopping cart, like spilling over 
And what we realized is we actually probably needed two shopping carts worth of food out there. <laughs> um, yeah. So we just cooked all, all the Yeah. So I, I did to want to mention you, one small night program that we do that I didn't touch on earlier, that as we were going out snorkeling, I believe we had a, a small a small encounter. Uh, we have a, a night scorpion program where, where we will do uh, a walk inside the fort, generally with very small groups. Uh, we have a lot of Boy Scouts, um, SOAR groups, which I, I call Opportunity Youth out during the summer. And so we'll do small uh, ranger-led programs inside the internal structure of the fort. Because uh, we have a brown bark scorpion, and when you just shine a regular light on it, you can't see it whatsoever inside the bricks. But when you shine a black light on it, it pops this bright purple. What what would you call that, Dennis? Like, what color was it? Oh, fluorescent purple. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's fluorescent, fluorescent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You can see them. They jump out. So it's kind of interesting. And they start going around and eating different lizards right around 1030, close to 11, before that they <laughs> hole up a little bit. And then they, they start coming lizards. around. And they, they do. They eat small, different uh, native lizards that we have. Uh, and then they will also attack each other as, as well. Uh, so they look like small little armored tanks moving throughout the, the brickwork and out through, throughout the mortar. Wow. Nancy's very familiar with bark scorpions, spiders, mm. uh, sp not spiders, uh, bark scorpions, and they tend to like, <laughs> like sting her. Yes. <laughs> She's had, not had that experience. Yeah, yeah. I had but, one that just stung me three times. We have the scorpions oh, are, no. are fascinating. Yeah. We, we, it, it was kind of, it, it, it hurt. You yeah, know? <laughs> they're but they're really yes, interesting. They're really hurt. But I mean, going through the old fort at night. Okay, so like any ghost stories, Curtis? Like I'm serious. I mean, there's got to be like yeah. vibes in there. No, uh, you know, I'm I'm sure there is. That there there are definitely people that have that have talked about it. We've had ghost hunters kind of come out. Cool. Both this and the cool. the sister fort, Fort Zachary Taylor. So even though the the Florida Keys and Key West are considered the southernmost part of of the United States, um, it was controlled by the Northern Army during the Civil War. And the fact that both of these forts were is a huge, huge historical significance. Um, a lot of the people that lived there during those times were affected by many different diseases. So uh, yellow fever ran rampant, um, you got dysentery, diarrhea, multiple different infirmaries where I believe around 80% at one point in time had come down with, with some sort of sickness. So we had quite a few deaths. Do I think that ghosts could have, could be there? Of course, you know, it, I don't doubt it, um, but I don't know. I don't have documented cases, um, but we do have a lot of people that are ghost hunters that come out. Uh, Fort Zach is also considered a very hot spot as far as orbs go and, um, you know, different cool. people that have passed during times. So, um, I, I would not doubt it. There's going to be scorpion orbs and lizard orbs and, <laughs> you know, people orbs. We'll have to document that on our tour. That's going to be our new thing is documenting ghosts. Ghosts. Oh, yeah. Cool. We, why not? That's cool. And they, stuff, man. they all kind of jive and, and make sure that you grab a black light next time that you're going to walk around Tucson and you don't want to get stung by a brown black <laughs> No kidding. A small no, black light and, and you will see them pop out like no other. <laughs> So this is, you know, this is what we're in that place where you, when you get up in the middle of the night, turn your light on before you go to the bathroom. <laughs> you know, that's, that's, a, that's an interesting conversation <laughs> for sure. Um, I did want to ask you, Dennis and, and Gavin, would you go back and, and do another program with the National Parks Arts Foundation? Because they've got yeah. all kinds of places. For sure. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Um, yes. That's, it's something that's on the table. Um, uh, yeah, and I don't know how much I can say about it. I think that that might be it. That's all I can say at this point. But, oh, come on, give us um, the scandal. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want the soup. I want the gossip. Uh, but what are, I know you've taken these amazing images, and I know that we've seen a portion of them, and it's just they're incredible. Um, what are your plans? Are you doing exhibits with them? Um, I heard a rumor of a possible book. Uh, what's, what's, what's happening? Yes. Well, the rumor mill is accurate, I guess. Yeah, I'm Yay. making a book. <laughs> cool. You got it. Um, I'm, I'm creating a book called Islands of Majesty, and it will contain photos from Loggerhead Key, as well as photos from um, near the Arctic Circle, um, from 
Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. Um, I did, um, I photographed lava there for um, a, about a year um, by helicopter, by boat, by f just walking out um, with a guide, of course. Um, so there's that. There's um, the world's rarest penguin in New Zealand. It's a yellow-eyed penguin, and they're so cute. Um, so lots of cuteness in the book. <laughs> Unintentional. <laughs> um, yeah, as well as auroras. Um, I have the northern lights as well as the southern lights, which people don't um, don't often think about. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Go, and people have got to go to your website again. It's DenessaChanPhotography.com, D-E-N-E-S-A. And I'm pronouncing it in so many different ways on this. I apologize that it's just it's cool. I'm having fun with it. Um, I, I have a final question for all of you here because it's talking about, you were talking about potlucks, you were talking about, you know, frozen gritty yogurt, um, nighttime stuff, you know, going out and exploring. So, we're going to play Island Campfire Karaoke. <laughs> Uh-oh. Oh, no. Everybody's like, what? Yeah, no. What? So you're going to have a campfire at Loggerhead Key, okay? You're going to have a nice little, you know, picnic-y thing. You're going to have, you know, have your time. Now, you each get to invite one guest to the campfire, okay? You are each, and it could be someone alive or passed on. It could be someone you just want to spend time around the campfire, so we need to know who that person is that you're having over at the campfire gathering. We want to know what each of you are serving because you're each responsible for food. <laughs> so we want to know what's happening there. And then when it comes to the karaoke part, we want to know what song you're going to sing at the end of the evening for entertainment. <laughs> <laughs> for everybody. <laughs> so this is the first island campfire gathering we've done. We've done other That's campfires, funny. but this is the first island one, and I like this. So let's start with you, Curtis. <laughs> oh, boy. Okay. Um, you know, I'm going to use a lifeline here, and, and I'm going to go back with the ghost, and, and I'm going to invite ne the ghost of Nelson Mandela just because he is just an amazing man that lived three lives whom if I ever had the chance to meet, that would be the person that I would want to sit around a campfire with. So um, I would invite the, the spirit and the ghost of Nelson Mandela, and I would make some, some local hogfish, um, possibly some lobster, although we don't allow lobstering within the boundaries of the park. Our park is only 99 square miles, and you can go just outside the park. So Yes, I would make a, a nice local dish with, with some of the fish. You can fish in 50% of the park, um, oh, wow. and that, that's who I would have. Yep, 50% of the park you, you can fish in, and about 50% is a research natural area, RNA area. Mm. Um, so that's who I would invite. And then I would sit wow. below. We, we can't do open fire campfire, but you know, oh, maybe okay. sit below uh, the, the harbor light there. Okay. So he's just making sure we don't be naughty new news in the park. <laughs> <laughs> you're not allowed to take anything out of the park either. Leave no trace. <laughs> so you got to right. clean up well, the, after your party, <laughs> which is a good so thing. So that the next person can experience it. Exactly. Exactly. But on that hey, note, yeah, but, yeah, but I want you, came up with it. I was going to say your song. You can't, you can't get out of the karaoke park. You know, I, I would get us all together and I'd do a little bit of electric slide. Old school 80s electric <laughs> slide. I like this. Okay, so okay, go ahead with your other comment about Gavin. Go, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I also wanted to say that in the majority of parks, you cannot use drones, and Gavin came up with a, an amazing idea. What is it that you did out there to get some of those aerial shots, Gavin? Oh, oh I did some kite aerial photography. So I uh, launched a, a single line kite and um, with a with a camera attached to it and walked around um, photographing um, various angles from the air. Um, wow, uh, that's like, smart. Yeah, look, looking at the lighthouse or looking straight down or looking down over the ocean. Or, oh, yeah, wow. Was cool. I never thought of that. That's huh. cool. Yeah. That's cool. That's really windy definitely... out there Me neither. all the time. <laughs> yeah, how cool. That's cool. Yeah, yeah the it's, drones, it's... that's important to let people know about the drones too because a lot of people... I always wonder about that because you walking through the forest and all of a sudden, zing, <laughs> you get zapped by a drone. I don't know. They're, they're weird, but they're cool, you know. Um, well, but that's, and yeah. especially at our park because, um, I mean, even in Key West, you can't fly drones. But at our park, especially because the amount of different seabirds that we have nest yeah. there um, mm -hmm. that are protected. And then also the way, one of the ways to get out there is through a seaplane. So when people are flying drones, it's 
very, very, very limited area that the channel that they can uh, run through. So drones are an extreme hazard out there. Uh, the drive for two goes. They're like uh, using, <laughs> using free drone spells. <laughs> Yeah, the, uh, the kite, kite thing was what people did before drones were invented. So. Yeah, see, there you go. Yeah. Go, go back to, yeah, mm -hmm. I like that. And, yeah, and that's fun. Even old school. Fun. Yeah. yeah. That's fun. Well, there's Robinson something magical Crusoe. about that. I know, exactly. That's <laughs> the fun part. Is, so it, it, Gavin's new name is MacGyver. <laughs> <laughs> so now we have your theme song. I know. That's awesome. That's awesome. So, Gavin, who, who's going to your campfire? Um, maybe Elon Musk. I think he'd be an interesting guy to have a chat yeah. to around a campfire. <laughs> he um, might light to, up to get for him you too. From his busy <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, th that would be interesting. Elon Musk is interesting. And he would be interested in, in kites and drones, too. I think that would be interesting. <laughs> He'd be interested in, sure. in, in that. So he's come in. Okay. So now what are you cooking? What's, what's on the menu? Um, the, my, the food would be a, um, uh, I think it's a New Zealand um, plant called a, uh, a kumara. kumara. Yeah. It's like a sweet potato. Oh. And you um you cut it into uh, wedges and put cheese in the middle and then you put it back together and wrap it in tin foil and mm. throw it in the fire and it sort of steams in its own juices and the cheese melts. Mm. And, mm. So, that's yeah. good. Yeah, it does. That sounds good. Sounds good. Yeah. And what food. are you entertaining us all with, singing wise? <laughs> um, the MacGyver soundtrack. <laughs> MacGyver. Yeah, we'll roll with that. <laughs> the original we're going to have a soundtrack, not the new I one. I don't know. At this point, you guys could all be the A team. Now, because I'm thinking of helicopters, could be like little drones. Sorry, I'm, like my brain went off in another direction. Um, I'll get it back. I'll get it back. So, Danessa, who's coming to your campfire? Oh, it would have to be Maya Angelou because oh. she, I love her work. She's inspired me my whole life. And um, it's not an exaggeration to say that she saved my life in high school. Um, so wow. Oh, wow. it would have to be her and I would serve. So I lived in Ghana, West Africa for a year mm. and I became completely addicted to, they have this amazing way of cooking, um, fried plantains, but they add ginger yeah. and spice, like hot and spicy and sweet mm -hmm. and delicious. So I would conjure up a way to make that amazing <laughs> dish and I would make it. And then um, I would probably for the karaoke, I would love to invite my Angelo to sing with me Nina Simone's Feeling Good. Oh, nice. No one yeah. ever said that at a campfire. That's, That's cool. cool. Can, can't Nina Simone come? I want to bring her. She's awesome. She's one of my yeah. favorite artists ever. Me yeah. Too. Oh, yes. And Bob cool. Dylan. Can we have Nina and Bob? <laughs> Joan, can we just have a big concert on the island? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that sounds that good. But you guys can make all the food. That's for sure. That's for sure. I love that. Well, you guys, thank you all for joining us on the show today. It's been such a pleasure, such an awesome conversation. I want to know where's next for you both. Well, What's the, the very very day? next. Thank you so much and for having us too. Um, the very, very next thing is we're going to go back to New Zealand and move our yurt um, into the mountains. So oh, after wow. we do that, yeah, um, after we do that, it will be off to Indonesia to photograph blue volcanoes um, wow. as well as well as Sumatran tigers. So Ooh. that'll be in the book too. Dude. Yeah. Can I just dude. say that like dude? dude. <laughs> just like that's just not fair. <laughs> that's awesome. I didn't know that you could take yurts across to a different country. I never thought of that. I never thought of transporting yurts, but I, you know, I thought that once you built them, they're there. We may be staying in a yurt for the first time when we get up to Colorado on our tour next year. Um, apparently, there's this yurt on a river. Um, built by an artist, and they're like, "Do you want to go stay in a yurt?" And we're like, "Yes, yeah. of course." Who doesn't want <laughs> to oh, cool. stay in a yurt? Anything that's round like that to me is the way we should be living in round structures. That's right. I agree. Yeah. yeah, there's no no it's, evil yeah. spirits can lurk. That's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no <laughs> ghosts. <laughs> they can hide in corners. There's no corners. That's exactly <laughs> why they built all the huts around. 
All right. Huh. Wow. Yeah, I love Was that. Every, everyone, again, a Dry Tortugas National Park, uh, put it on your bucket list. Um, and we don't really want to say bucket list because then we're going to be seeing you as an orb somewhere. Um, it, it's the living <laughs> list. Put it on your living list. Uh, it is nps.gov forward slash drto. Uh, go check it out. We also have it up on nationalparktraveling.com, uh, but we'll really get it up on, on our site and rolling as soon as we get out there. So, uh, Curtis, is there a best time of year to come out, or is it open year round? It, it doesn't matter what time of year we come out. You know, that really depends on individual likes and interests. Um, mm -hmm. Right now, fall migration, we have tons of people coming out that are birders. During the winter with the fort design, you know, this is part of the third system of fortifications that was built on down the East Coast. We have people that come out that are really interested in fort design because the sea state gets a little bit rougher during the winter and into the early spring. During the summer, we have very little winds, crystal clear, deep waters. That's when we get a lot of people that come out that are really interested in marine resources and snorkeling and corals. I mean, some of the corals that we have out there, like the federally endangered staghorn corals, we have areas where we have pH monitors through the United States Geological Survey because it's bouncing back. Globally, it's getting declining, but in a certain area there, we're actually seeing more growth. So it really depends on the individual users. We have people that come out that just want to enjoy a night sky on, you know, on a new moon when it's super dark. So it depends on what your likes and your interests are. That's the best time to go out. Just know that seasonally during the winter, early spring, that's when we get our strong winds. Of course, during the fall, we had Hurricane Irma last year. During the summer, that's when it's real nice and flat, but it's also when it's a lot warmer. Mm -hmm. And the scorpions, you can see them. <laughs> <laughs> They're waiting for you. They're waiting no, for you in they... your nightlight. <laughs> That's great. Uh, everybody, again, Danessa Chan, photography.com, and, of course, uh, National Park Arts Foundation org. They so rock. I want to give a shout-out to Tanya Ortega. Uh, you know what? Uh, we've been working with her over the last few years, uh, you know, just talking with all these amazing artists. And when we talk about world class, they truly are. Uh, so whether you, if you're not an artist, you can still be involved. Uh, go to the different events that the artists held in the parks uh, when they're in residence. Uh, you can donate. That's another thing you can do. Um, but also follow them on Facebook, on Twitter, and sign up for their newsletter to keep up with what's going on because it's just amazing work coming out of these parks and amazing experiences being had. Okay, so Big Blend Radio airs Friday through Sunday. Keep up with our schedule at BigBlendRadio.com. You can listen as shows go live or you can listen anytime at your leisure. Um, and we've got a special song for you. It's called Silver Ghost. <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> I didn't plan it that way. I, I chose chose this song because it's uh, from a you know a friend of ours, uh, James Saunders, over in uh, Hermanus, which is just outside uh, Cape Town, South Africa. And uh, this song is about a fish. And um, and I didn't know we were going to talk about ghosts today, but now it really <laughs> works. Uh, but uh, James, jamessaundersmusician.com is the website to go to for his music. It's amazing. He's on Apple Music, uh, iTunes, all those great things, Spotify. Um, but here it is, Silver Ghost. Take care, everybody. Thank you Take so care. much.
gliding with my dreams. My dreams.